So an iPad, does it really bring value to a classroom? Or is it just a toy? This is a big question we had amongst all teachers, as the iPad was a really big disruptor in the way we teach. To explain that, please let me give you an example. One day I was in my class about to teach research. It's quite a tedious topic. Students don't enjoy it that much. So I really had to give him my best shot, my best delivery, to get students engaged in what I was about to tell them. So I started my class, started teaching, and then suddenly, in the back of the room, I see this. One of the students holding his iPad on the air, moving it around like that. And I was thinking, what are you doing? So I stopped teaching. He realized that I saw him, so he put his iPad down. I didn't say anything, but I was a bit put out. I was wondering, shouldn't you be listening to what I'm saying rather than playing a game? But I, I went on anyway. I looked at him. He didn't pay attention to anything I had to say. But it was not only because of him only. I realized that many students were disengaged, especially the longer I talked, the easier for them was it to completely lose focus and interest. So as a teacher, you're not happy. You, you want everybody to be engaged in what you say. So I started to do some reading, and I found a very interesting piece of research from Eric Mazur from Harvard University. And he, he, he speaks about one specific piece of research where he looks at students' brain activity during a day. And it's how it looks like. So you see the brain activity going through the day, <laughs> and the student in the classroom, actually the brain is dead, less active than in sleep. <laughs> so can you imagine for teachers like us how that is not very encouraging? Another interesting research that I found was from Dr. John Medina. He's written a great book called Brain Rules. And one of these rules is called the 10-minute rule. It's the amount of time that you have to catch your uh, audience's attention. After that, the brain just goes away. It's much more difficult for us to focus. So we learned that students get easily bored in the classroom. We learned that if you're lucky, you would maybe get 10 minutes attention. But when my student was playing with his iPad, he was very engaged in that and very attentive. So why can't we use play in the class? So, but if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, it's apparently not appropriate, because play and work are two different things. And it's quite common perception today that when you work, you don't play. So when you study, you work hard. Hence, you don't play. But is it really true? Do you love playing games? I do. And I realize that I learn a lot when I play games. But I also see that when we play together with my daughters, they also enjoy playing games, but they learn a lot. Here we play a Star Wars game together. We play a Catan game together, which is a strategy game. And not only do they enjoy playing hard games, because there's a lot of rules in these games, but I see that they develop great skills in reading, mathematics, negotiating. I would even argue that they start thinking strategically, even if they are quite young. Sometimes they're even more strategic than me. And G from Arizona State University actually explains that when we are playing, the brain works in very similar ways that when we are studying. And companies have been using play recently. And we can put play in three different categories, which are simulation, gamification, and game-based learning. I'm going to explain how we use those three different types of play in the classroom at the Swiss Hotel Management School with quite some success. So the first one is simulation. You all know simulation. It's been here for like quite a while. Companies use it to train their employees, like airlines use simulation to train their pilots. The US Army use simulation to train their military. But we use simulation for a topic students don't enjoy that much as well, called accounting. <laughs> and we use simulation as students are actually running a hotel, a simulated hotel, through their iPads. They make decisions on how much they want to invest, how much they want to spend, what rates they want to set, 
and they see the results of those decisions. It's not anymore about teaching them to do a PNL, calculate ratios, but it's about giving them the opportunity to think and reflect on the decisions they've made. For example, a student might decide to win the game, and by doing that, she's not going to renovate her rooms. But what might happen is our customers might go to someone else's hotel because the rooms are not good enough. And by playing that, she learns that which normally is always taught by teachers. So, and what is also very interesting with this is that we can see that students are actually very motivated to read financial statements. That doesn't sound right. Students motivated to read financial statements, but they really are because it helps them win the game. The second use of play is called gamification. You might have heard about it, or you might use it every day because it's really everywhere. It's a use of point, badges, leaderboards that get us motivated to achieve a certain goal. It's in our loyalty programs. Starbucks uses it and gives you little points and badges depending on how much you spend. It's in our fitness trackers. It tells us how much we walk and exercise. And if you walk enough, it gives you a little badge. And sometimes, you're almost there, so you're going to walk out, you're going to go out and walk and exercise just to get that badge. Right? Hmm? So that's gamification, what this gamification is all about. And we are using an app called Kahoot. Kahoot is a simple quiz app, but it uses some play element to get students motivated. The questions are shown on the board. There's a little fun music in the background. Question uh, uh, limited in time. Students input the answers on their iPad, and they get scores, depending on how quickly they, correct, they answer and how quickly and how correctly they answer as well. At the end, there's a podium with the winner, and it really motivates students. That's just one of the class playing the game, got the right answer, and everybody is motivated and see and happy that they got the right answer. Traditionally, if I ask a question to my students, only the good ones would answer. Everybody else wants to leave as quickly as possible because they want to go for lunch. But with this, we can see that students are motivated. They even want to play the second time. And everybody is motivated to play the game because they want to try to win it, so they give their best shot. So that's Kahoot. Another app that we use is called Quizlet, app, Quizlet Live. It's an app that allows us to link Definition with terms. Very simple. You have a de definition on top and you have the matching term below. But the right term might not be on your screen because the app puts you together in a team and as a team you need to match those two together. So you sit down with your team, you look at the terms, you look at the right term, you try to find it and oops, this team didn't get it right. So what is gamification about? Gamification because the team that reaches 12 points first wins the game and stops for everybody else. So you can say, okay, they're just going to qu answer as quickly as possible then. But that's not possible because if you reach 10 points and you get it wrong, it puts you down to zero. So a game can easily last half an hour, 45 minutes. And this is an example of students after 30 minutes of play, how happy and motivated they were to have won. One more time, she says. She wanted to play again. And I'm going to show you one more example, because I'd like you to think back to your school. When a teacher asks you to read definitions, did you like that? Students don't, in general. But look how motivated they are at looking at definitions, looking at specific terms, trying to match them together. They're really, really passionate, because again, they want to win the game. Alexandra talked about dopamine, and it's all about that as well. And finally, last example of play is game-based learning. Game-based learning is when you ask students to play a game and they learn from playing that game. One of our teachers, Xavier Villain, teaches revenue management. And he asks students to play Farmville. And from playing Farmville, to see what students are learning. Because the concepts are actually very similar. And what is interesting is that they, when they give answers, they actually understand the topic without having learned the theories first. 
And that's the idea of game-based learning, is that students practice, and through the practice, they learn. And with games, it gives them also a fun environment in which to play. So technology eventually was great, because without technology, we would not have been able to do simulations, gamification, game-based learning. But you don't always need technology to play a game. For example, there's a great game that I love to play, which is called Antique. You run a civilization, like the Romans or the Egyptians, you construct your civilization, you attack your enemies, you build temples, fantastic game. But what is great about the game is there is no luck involved. It's all about your choices, it's all about your strategy. And whenever I played this game, I am always told myself, I want to use it to teach strategy. And then I talked to my colleague, Patrick Taffin, and I said, and he said, why don't we do it? Let's go ahead, let's create the game. So we took the exact same rules, but we changed it so the students are running a hospitality company rather than a civilization. We use class time, where we put students together in groups, and they play the game for more than two hours. And there's many different ways to win the game. You can expand your brand, you can build palaces, you can buy over the competition, you can acquire capabilities. But what we've seen is that the, the students who have won are the one who set a very specific strategy and set to that strategy. But that's like in real life. We have some strategies in the, cl in the class, in the audience, so it's real life. You need to set your strategy and stick to it. So what does they've learned by playing the game? And that's what we also tell them in the, in the theory as well. So they've been able to put it into practice. After two hours of play, I didn't see anybody check their Facebook or check their Instagram. They really, really were engrossed in the play. And after two hours, one team was a little bit behind, so all the rest of the class came looking around and tried to comment and give recommendations. And at the end of the session, we ran a debriefing and asked them, what did you learn? And students were able to really relate all the strategic theoretical terms to the way they played. How we were stuck in the middle. We were differentiators. We tried to lower our costs. It was really, really interesting. So, play is great. Do you need game to play? Not all the time. You can actually play by having a brainstorming session in the classroom. You can play by role-playing a business situation. You can play by having a debate in the classroom. Now, with the technology, you can play and asking students to create a video and then share it on social media and see the amount of likes that they have. So, what what makes play so engaging? It's engaging because it makes the student active. They are active participants in their own learning. They're just not sitting there passively listening to an expert. And on top of that, they have fun. So while they have fun, they are interested. And they're interested, they pay attention. And it's not anymore just about memorization, it's about deeper learning. In the introduction, I said that the iPad disrupted the way we teach. But I wasn't completely correct. It didn't disrupt the way we teach. It forced us and gave us the opportunity to reflect on our teaching methods. And rather than focus on us teaching, we decided to focus on the students' learning. Thank you very much.